But this is the lecture outline. Uh, I start with an introduction, um, which will, will, I'll be give shortly. Uh, then uh, the vision, why floating urban development and why do we need this now? What's the urgency? I will talk about the technical feasibility of floating structures. Um, then about the environmental impacts and regenerative design of floating structures. I'll talk about governance and socioeconomic acceptance of this technology. The transformative capacity of society, how do we move forward? Then I will discuss the potential of floating structures that I think is there for Hong Kong. And I will end with the conclusions. And after that, there's also still time uh, for questions and answers. A little bit about my company, 21. Um, we're completely uh, specialized in this field of floating urban uh, development, but we're an interdisciplinary team. Uh, our team includes uh, maritime engineers, civil engineers, but also architects, uh, people specialized in industrial production, uh, people more focused on the environmental impact. And our characteristic is that we want to move from dream to project. So, uh, of course, sometimes we have to dream about the floating cities, but our mission is not to, to think ahead 20 years, 50 years, but also to establish concrete projects already today and tomorrow, because that's very important that we have a realistic approach. And we're um, very much focused on networking. We have partnerships with world leading knowledge institutes, companies and investors uh, to have this societal impact that we're aiming for. Then I'll, uh, I'll go to the vision, the second part of my lecture. Uh, why do we need floating developments and why do we need it now? If we look at the global challenges for 2050, uh, we're facing a big urban challenge. We see that most cities still need to be built. The urban space, the size of the urban area in the world will need to more than double to accommodate uh, population growth, but also the urbanization challenges that we're facing. And so today's cities, they only provide 40% of the space that were required in 2050. And imagine that in the next 40 years, more urban space will be built than in the past 4,000 years. And then you will get a sense of the challenge, the urban challenge that we are facing. At the same time, we're facing a projected sea level rise uh, in the coming decades of about 30 centimeters. But at the end of this century, it might be more. It could be one meter, but depending on what's happening uh, on the Antarctic South Pole, it could also be much more. We know this, and we also know that we're facing more extreme weather conditions, more storms, more droughts and flooding. And we also know that 50% of the global population is living within 100 kilometers from the coast. It's quite vulnerable location. Another big land um, challenge that we're facing is the land shortage to feed the global population. And we have estimated in our own research that already in 2050, less than 30 years from now, uh, we need 22 million square kilometers additional land space. And that's about the same size of the total uh, land area of North America. And we need this space for food production, for growing cities, for biofuel and other functions that we think are very important. So these three uh, challenges are the, the main reasons why I think this is a time when we need to start thinking about other solutions than the traditional solutions that we have applied so far. The solution that we have been quite busy with in the past 15 years is creating new space on the water. In the left uh, top of the figure, you see uh, a coastal city, a schematic uh, representation. And of course, uh, this, this coastal city, uh, like Hong Kong, like many cities, uh, are, is facing land shortage. Um, high rise can provide part of the solution, uh, certainly is a good example here in Hong Kong. But what many cities are doing, they're sacrificing farmland, they're sacrificing na nature, and they're moving into floodplains. And uh, as, you, as you know, this will have negative impact. Uh, so the, the farmland is needed to for the global uh, growing population. We need nature because we're part of the ecosystem and we need it uh, to be able to live on the planet. And moving into floodplain will increase flood risk and also increase the damage that occurs due to more extreme weather conditions. So the solution that we have been working on is to move onto the water. Uh, since most of the cities already are along the coast, cities could expand on the water to create more housing, but also, and this is very important, not only housing, but also floating LJ system that would create biofuels. Uh, we could go for aquaculture, fish and seafood, uh, hydroponic systems where we have uh, vegetable cultivation together with aquaculture, and also uh, LJ systems that can provide part of the protein that the world needs. So it's very important to look at uh, floating development in an holistic way. And by doing that, uh, for instance, by uh, increasing also the 
extend the floating algae system, we can take out from the atmosphere the CO2. And so we can address the climate challenges and trying to address the root causes of climate change. And if we do it like this, uh, floating urban development can really be a new chapter in the urban development and really provide a really promising way forward for the challenges that we are facing. Still at the moment, most cities resort to land reclamation. Many examples all over the world, and certainly also in Hong Kong, land reclamation has been a very important technology in the past, and I believe will also still be an te important technology in the future. Um, but uh, there's still problems associated with land reclamation, and one big problem is that the sand that we can use for land reclamation is getting very scarce. So uh, in this publication by Nature from 2019, we see that Actually, uh, there's more sand demand than there is that can be supplied. Uh, and hence, as a result, the sand price has increased a lot. And this will also increase uh, the cost of future land reclamations. Secondly, we see uh, many negative ecological impacts and, uh, of land reclamation. And also the social acceptance of land reclamation is uh, decreasing. Uh, ecosystems are um, uh, destroyed. They disappear under the sand. And, um, and this is also one of the reasons why the public is less accepting now the land reclamation than uh, they have been doing this in the past. If we look at the floating development versus land reclamation, we see that uh, floating adapts to a changing sea level and uh, that you don't need the landfill and therefore it's less disruptive to the environment. And I think it's also important if we want to achieve fast construction, we can have possible prefabrication of floating structures elsewhere with fast deployment uh, in the city that we're, uh, that we're building. And so for instance, here in Hong Kong, we could have many uh, construction locations where we produce the floating platforms and then they can be moved to Hong Kong. And by doing this, we can uh, have a cheaper construction, but also much faster. If you compare this to land reclamation, uh, land reclamation will need dikes uh, if, if sea level rise continues, which it will. And we see detrimental impacts on corals and marine life. And we also see that we need large scale and large construction periods. So for instance, also the settlements uh, that the sand needs before you can build on it can easily take at least five years and sometimes even more. And there are more uh, effects to this. Um, floating has also has a benefit that is more scalable. There's no time required for the stabilization of the soil. It's resistant to earthquakes and tsunamis. And it can also create under the floating platforms, new ecological habitat. And compared to uh, land reclamation, there's a large capital investment needed to get started. And we're seeing negative impacts on corals and marine life and also potential dangers of soil liquefaction. And uh, I think um, if we compare them economically, uh, this is an analysis we have done for the European Commission. It's published in the Space at Sea report that you can uh, visit on, uh, on your own. I need to stress that this is an illustrative example based on location and project specific data, in this case, the Mediterranean Sea. But here you can see uh, how land reclamation compares to floating development. And the break even point of around 30 meters is quite interesting. Yeah? So in this case, around 30 meters, that's where uh, there's a break even point. And if you go to deeper waters, uh, the land reclamation will become more expensive. That's quite logical because you need more sand to be able to do it. And then the floating development gets more attractive. And therefore, I think that combining land reclamation with floating has a big potential, certainly also here in Hong Kong. So the shallower parts that could still be done with land reclamation, but the deeper parts, this is where the, the floating could be very promising. I think there are benefits in combining land reclamation with floating. Uh, reclaim, reclaimed land creates perfect calm conditions for floating. Uh, and land reclamation can still be applied for high rise buildings, uh, which is more difficult, of course, on floating platforms. And floating can be applied to the low rise buildings and public space, cultural and recreational facilities. And also in traditional high rise developments, uh, there will be needed space for parks, uh, for public space. There will also be some low rise, uh, maybe 20%, maybe 30%. And it's this part that could be made floating. And uh, I want to acknowledge um, the PolyU Research Institute, Professor uh, Zhao in particular for pointing this out. Uh, so that also in high rise developments, uh, yeah, there's a need for, yeah, for these facilities that could be made floating. So I think the combination of the two could be the best of both worlds. Uh, and it uh, could also be much easier to accept in the policy context on the short term. If we uh, link the characteristics to our business objectives, 
Uh, we want to achieve an improved flexibility and adaptability, a reduced demand of sand and materials, and we want to achieve a faster building time. And I believe that this can be achieved uh, with uh, this hybrid development. Which brings me to the technical feasibility. Is technology of uh, floating structures, is it possible? Is it feasible? Uh, can it be done? This is, of course, very important when we're talking about these hybrid developments and floating developments. What are the technologies that we have available? Uh, we have combinations of polystyrene and concrete. For instance, uh, the flex-based system that we applied uh, in our first project with, the, with our founders of Blue 21, the floating pavilion in Rotterdam. Uh, you see that um, on the top, you see this uh, polystyrene blocks with a grid of concrete beams. On top of that, there's another concrete layer. And this creates a very stiff, but still very light uh, floating construction. We're also seeing the fiber reinforced composites. Uh, then uh, Balanced Dough was uh, the pioneer company that applied that in one of the projects that we worked on in, uh, with Blue 21 in, um, in the city of Delft, our hometown. And this was quite interesting because this is where steel frame constructions were applied together with the fiber reinforced uh, composites, creating a very strong light and very maintenance, almost maintenance free system. The most applied system we see today in the floating urban development is still the concrete uh, caisson. So it's uh, basically the hollow concrete uh, boxes uh, that we're seeing. Uh, because it's hollow, it has a, has a good buoyancy and you can, on top of these structures, you can uh, build uh, buildings. And you can also connect these buildings, uh, these modules to form larger structures. And then finally, the steel. Uh, most famous example is the mega float project in the Bay of Tokyo in the 90s. Uh, where uh, steel modules were being welded together to form, in this case, a runway for a floating airport of a thousand meters long. So these are the most applied technologies that we have available to uh, create floating projects. A little bit more about uh, the floating pavilion, uh, our first uh, project that we made with our company. It's in Rotterdam. Uh, this is, was the first location where it was made in the city center of Rotterdam and it was used as an exhibition space for conferences, uh, workshops and meetings. Uh, and it adapts to the sea level, uh, sea level changes uh, on a daily basis because it's located in a tidal area. And here you can see what the inside looks like. It's really a nice space. It's made of a steel frame construction and not with glass, but we used inflatable cushions instead to reduce the weight of this building. And here a little bit more about uh, how we made it. So the left uh, top uh, picture, the first day of the construction, here you see the polystyrene plates. Left button, you see uh, on top of these polystyrene plates, polystyrene blocks uh, that form the last uh, formwork for the concrete. And on top of that, again, a concrete layer. Uh, prefabricated steel frame construction, which was made in only a couple of days uh, on top of that platform. And then uh, we used mountain climbers from Germany that uh, helped us to install the inflatable cushions. Uh, and in the center, you see me uh, while being at uh, the construction works uh, in one of the uh, earlier days of the construction. I think a very important feature of floating, and then also in this case, was that the possibility to relocate. So the floating pavilion after 11 years was moved to a new location and is now used as an um, innovation facility for the Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences. Um, and I think this is very important uh, that this relocation allows the flexibility for temporary use. And we can give the buildings a new function, but also a new location, uh, which means that we can also work with temporary permits allowing more flexible frameworks of urban planning. A floating housing project that we worked on uh, here in Delft, it was, um, yeah, it was in our hometown, a beautiful uh, floating houses that you see. And here again, some more uh, close up pictures of the steel frame construction that was used. And on top of that, the fiber reinforced skin was applied to form this very strong and maintenance free uh, floating foundation. In this case, a produced, uh, on the land and then with a crane, it was put in the water. Very unique project and what's very interesting, I'll go back one, is that um, yeah, the citizens themselves, uh, they created this project together with the municipality. So there was no project developer involved, people really did it uh, themselves and we assisted in this, uh, in this process. It's not only about housing, this is a prototype we did together with the TU Delft for floating, uh, floating solar. In this case, on both sides of the uh, panel, uh, floating solar is applied. So it's a bifacial, which uh, increases the, uh, yeah, the yield of the solar power. So of course we can do this on a much larger scale uh, to produce energy for the floating developments. 
So the conclusion of that is that the building blocks for floating developments are there. We have floating walkways, we have floating districts, floating ports, floating breakwaters, swimming pools, floating wind farms. So the building blocks to create floating urban development is there. And not only in my company, many companies have worked on this in many locations in the world. So I think we can work with this, but uh, what we need is to increase the scale of those developments. So they're still a little bit small. The challenges are very big. So we need to work on how can we apply this technology on a much larger scale. We want to scale up housing, logistics, and energy. On the left, you see a very big uh, floating uh, urban uh, design that we designed for the European Union. On the right, you see what, for instance, a floating container terminal could look like. And floating container terminals would be very promising because often container terminals, uh, they occupy very valuable land. Uh, and if we realize that much of the transit is transshipment, so you have the big ships coming in and, they, and then the loads and the containers are distributed to much smaller ships. There's not a reason why that should occur on the land. It could also be done more offshore. And then the very valuable land um, uh, yeah, could uh, be used for other functions. Uh, plus that much larger ships could be accommodated because we could do this in deeper waters. And so the most modern, largest cargo ships could be facilitated by developments like this. And the transshipment could still be used for the smaller ship to distribute the containers over, over the entire region. In this case, uh, the Bay Area in the Netherlands, it would be the Northwest Europe or even all Europe. So I think this is also a very uh, interesting uh, development that we could look, look at. This is a picture that the Maritime Research Institute from the Netherlands uh, made. Uh, what you're looking at is the port of Rotterdam. Uh, on the right, uh, you see the old ports that are quite shallow and they can be repurposed for floating urban development. Uh, the area in the middle, uh, this is where now the big uh, facilities are for fossil fuels, but we're in a transition to more bio-based fuels and hydrogen, uh, creating a land shortage there because at a certain point, we need to accommodate both, both the fossil fuels and both, uh, let's say, the sustainable fuels in this transition period. This is where the mobile synthetic fuel terminals could play a role. And more near shore, floating structures could facilitate wind and hydrogen logistics. Uh, and also offshore, this could be done. And we're also studying the possibility of floating eco rifts and coastal protection. So we can have floating breakwaters with uh, ecological systems that can facilitate uh, yeah, also this coastal protection. And then further in the future, we could also have floating city development at sea. So these are the topics that we're studying together with uh, Marin and the Netherlands, uh, applied on the Rotterdam case study. Rotterdam is still the largest port in Europe uh, that is also seriously now looking at these kind of solutions uh, together with us and also other partners. But uh, that's of course has technological consequences if you're going to upskill and uh, you're talking about larger uh, floating structures. And uh, one of the pioneers in, uh, in the Netherlands was Jan van Kessel. He did a PhD thesis on mega floaters. And he really started to study uh, the hydroelasticity of floating structures. And because if the floating structures get very large, we can no longer regard them as rigid bodies, like what we often do in shipbuilding. And we need to take into account the hydroelasticity effects of these uh, very large floating structures. And um, this field of expertise was pioneered by Jan van Kessel in our, in our company. And following that, in our collaboration with the Technical University of Delft, uh, many students completed their master thesis on this topic. And so the impact of floating breakwaters, the hydro, hydroelastic analysis of multi-model, very large floating structures, but also how tsunami transitions, uh, transmissions would influence floating cities. So all of these aspects that we are studying, uh, they're often uh, students graduating in our team, uh, supervised also with the two Delft, and this is a very fruitful collaboration. Uh, engineering tools that our company applies to analyze much larger floating structures, uh, these are tools that also other companies use, like finite element methods. Uh, I already talked about the hydroelastic modeling, but we have also created our own uh, very sophisticated HydroMac Plus tool. It's our in-house tool that enables us to evaluate uh, the wave response of floating structures. Uh, we, can have, uh, we can help architects to evaluate these uh, effects, uh, looking at the safety, looking at comfort. Uh, and, and by doing this, uh, we can create very comfortable and safe floating structures and we can assist architects and urban planners working on this topic. Uh, and of course, that's very important because we want to be uh, safer than land. Uh, we want to create very flood resilient and comfortable structures. Um, and this is an animation. We applied to HydroMac Plus 2 on our own project. Uh, the, so what you're looking at is a very exceptional storm that would only occur one in a hundred years on average. 
and you see how the floating pavilion responds uh, to this uh, system. And you can see that it's quite uh, stable, but this is just to give you an example of the kind of analysis that we can do, how we can simulate before we start building it, very important, uh, how this uh, project would, uh, yeah, would respond to very extreme storm and wave conditions. Uh, also very important are the wave basin tests that we have uh, completed with, uh, with Marin in Wageningen uh, in the Netherlands. Here you see a part of this European research project uh, in the wave basin. Um, and this is a scale model. But on this scale model, we can apply waves and then we can evaluate the response, the wave response, the movements, but also the forces on the connectors, the forces on the mooring system. And you see on the left, you see floating housing uh, models, but here you see the floating container terminal model that I talked about. And also these tests have included floating aquaculture, fish cultivation, and also floating solar uh, and other functions. So it's a multifunctional floating facility that we have evaluated. And just to show you that already quite advanced research has been done on this topic. It's not just an idea and uh, the technological feasibility of these, also these larger floating structures has been thoroughly and quite profoundly been researched by very uh, yeah, leading researchers. So uh, I think the technological basis of floating development uh, is quite solid and could certainly be applied uh, in cities uh, all over the world. But of course, uh, if we are going to do that, uh, we also are uh, yeah, concerned about the environmental impact. Um, uh, T1 is a sister company in Dymo, and uh, in Dymo is specialized uh, in applying underwater drones, aquatic drones for monitoring. It started in 2015 and is now active in international projects. Uh, we have worked in Indonesia, Peru, in Mali, in Africa, but also in Myanmar, Vietnam, and Portugal. And of course, in the Netherlands, that's where we did most of our work. Uh, work together a lot with government agencies. What you can see here is that we have, these are just the different types of drones that we have evaluated for our work. So we're using the underwater drones to do the monitoring and to evaluate what is the impact of floating developments uh, on uh, the water quality. And so we have looked at dissolved oxygen, the conductivity, also things like uh, uh, biological activity, chlorophyll, turbidity, algae systems, the pH. Um, so this is the kind of work that we're doing. This is the kind of results it produces. And so we can uh, look at temperature, dissolved oxygen, we can do scans for uh, blue-green algae. You see the ecological observations made with underwater drones, but we can also do inspections. And so we do here measurements inside the culverts, you see it here with sonar systems. And you can imagine that we can also use this technology, of course, to inspect uh, floating platforms for maintenance. We have done for six or even more, I think seven years measurement campaign with these uh, facilities to evaluate uh, what's the water quality and ecological impacts of uh, floating structures. These results have been published scientifically in the Journal of Water and Climate Change, open source available. Uh, but what we have seen from this research is that we haven't found very negative impacts on the water quality. And what we've also noticed is that quite quickly after installing these kind of floating structures, we see an enrichment of the ecology. We see that new ecological habitat is created, as you can also see in these moving images. And of course, that creates potential that a floating urban development can actually be an addition to the aquatic ecology if we apply it in the right way. So we're looking at ecological design. How can we make floating structures that actually contribute to, to ecosystems? And uh, by designing the floating structures above the water, but also underwater, can we use 3D printed facilities underwater to facilitate ecological growth? Uh, can we use coastal protection and at the same time create new marshlands uh, by protecting the coast? So these are all topics where we try to apply the insights that we learned from our ecological research. How can we apply it in our design work? But also things like facilities. So this is a project we did for French Polynesia where we looked at uh, decentral concepts of water, uh, decentral concepts of energy. Um, can we make closed loop systems, a very circular systems, the principles of circularity? If we apply this in a proper way and all the technologies to do this are available and we can have a positive impact on the environment and not only reduce our environmental impact, but uh, move towards CO2 neutral circular systems that also create ecological structures under the water and above the water and, and integrate it with water treatment, constructed wetlands and food production. Very important. 
We think we need to move from mitigating ne negative impacts of urban development uh, to actually move to projects that improve the water quality and provide habitat. That would also facilitate that we can move from permanent building permits to conditional permits based on the environmental impact. This would mean that a uh, floating building would only have a permit as long as there's positive environmental impacts. And these could of course be evaluated by open source data facilitated by um, underwater drones. And we can also move from land ownership to more providing ecological services. So as long as the building provides ecological services uh, and the building wouldn't need to be relocated maybe in the future, land ownership might become less important. We could work with permits um, and we can use to create these kind of ecological systems. So I think it's possible to have this positive ecological impact, but what about governance? How can we implement these kind of concepts in a social economic context? How do we deal with legislation and government processes, spatial planning, all very important questions. I think a very important thing is how can we contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Uh, in 2030, we need to achieve all these goals. We have seven years to go. And I think uh, floating developments can contribute to many of the goals here, but in particular, number 11, sustainable cities and communities, and number 14, life below water. This has also been acknowledged by the IPCC, so we were very happy to see that in the Climate Change 2022 report of the IPCC, floating urban development has been uh, recognized as a possible adaptation option, and our project of floating pavilion Rotterdam has also been acknowledged as a uh, example project for transformative adaptation. The report stresses that uh, the seawalls and levees uh, can protect people and property in the short term, uh, but they will require quite expensive upgrades to sustain, uh, to adapt to sea level rise. And the floating structures, houses and cities were mentioned for the first time at such a scale uh, in different chapters in the IPCC report. We have also seen that UN Habitat has recognized the potential of floating development already in 2019 at the first ever high level roundtable discussion on floating cities in the headquarters of the United Nations in New York. They have stressed that floating developments can provide an alternative. And we see that cities are stepping up for implementation. We saw in South Korea, Singapore, but also the Maldives where uh, uh, our collaboration partner, Water Studio has created a great design and is now actually building uh, this, this project, a uh, floating city that also adapts to climate change. And of course, for many island states all over the world, this could provide a very interesting solution. Uh, we are quite happy that um, uh, we were appointed by the city of Busan. Uh, personally, I was uh, appointed as part of the task force to assist uh, the city of Busan uh, as part of our knowledge sharing uh, in, this, in their endeavor to, um, to really try and create already quite soon in 2030, the first uh, realized the, fir the first world's first sustainable prototype of a floating city. I think that's also great uh, that Busan is showing this leadership and uh, we're very happy that we can uh, contribute by uh, sharing our knowledge with them. One of the important uh, yeah, knowledge fields that we have is uh, the Space at Sea project that we did for the European Commission. I already talked about that uh, more with uh, 17 European partners. And we were in charge of the Living at Sea work package uh, number uh, seven and Marin and the Maritime Research Institute in the Netherlands was in charge of the whole project. Um, and what you see here, I think it's quite important. Eh? So um, it's not only about technology. We have to look at the policymakers perspective. Eh? How can we meet standards? And we need to look at the investors perspective. How can we meet their interests? And we need to use that, look at the end users. And all of this was done in the Space at Sea project and this work package uh, living at sea. Uh, so in the end, it's about social acceptance and policy acceptance and involving the stakeholders in these kind of developments. Of course, the challenge is that we uh, have to look both at technical regulatory frameworks from offshore but also the urban, and they're quite different. So uh, we're talking about international maritime law, uh, other conventions and maritime classifications that we have to look at, uh, ISO standards. And of course, we also have to take into account uh, building legislation that's applied on the coast and on the land, and we need to integrate them. So that's what we have done in this uh, project. And the reports that came out of that process are open source available, both on the Space at Sea website, but also uh, on the website of uh, Blue21. And these are some of the examples that we have reviewed so in the Netherlands, we have already quite a good code of practice. Uh, I wouldn't say perfect, but there, there's been quite some progress in that field uh, in terms of building legislation, building standards for floating. And, and we have also uh, studied uh, those 
those and, and integrated it with the with maritime uh, frameworks and translate that into a conceptualization and the design for the living at sea. So uh, here you see the different functions that we studied, green space functions, floor space, air, uh, uh, mobility and access and integrated that in, uh, in the design of this floating structure. And uh, one of the designs that we made was this very large scale floating city development of 50,000 inhabitants. Um, not high rise, but certainly also not a single houses, so really large apartment complexes of a couple of floors uh, that would provide this. And this uh, city scheme that you're looking at would consist of modules of 75 by 75 meters. Uh, and then they would be connected together at the location and they could facilitate housing, but also commercial property and other real estate functions. So this is really yeah, another skill than the projects that we have seen uh, thus far. And again, uh, it was not only a nice design, we have uh, done a lot of work on the technical feasibility of these kind of larger scale floating developments. So that was about uh, the governance. Now I move forward to the transformative capacity. So how can we move forward? What do we need to do to, to make this reality? Because if we're convinced about the technical feasibility, we're, we're happy about the potential, the environmental potential. Uh, we see that there's also a governance framework. We see a rising uh, socioeconomic acceptance for these kind of solutions. What, uh, how can we make the next step? I think it's important to look at uh, climate resilience as a broader framework. Um, and uh, the book that I uh, coordinated uh, presents five capacities. Um, threshold capacity is very important. Uh, so we can build the dikes, we can uh, protect ourselves against the sea level rise, for instance, but still uh, that will not be enough uh, because uh, there can always be, um, there can be circumstances when just a storm is too big, when we need to cope with with the effects of flooding. And, and there, I think, is coping capacity very important. Recovery capacity means that we can recover quickly after uh, natural disasters. And adaptive capacity is that we can adapt to the future that we don't know yet. And so we don't know at the moment how big the sea level rise is going to be, but still we need to make decisions today about the future of our cities. So we need to be adaptive and we need to have flexibility at the same time be robust so that we can prepare for different possible futures. And then transformative capacity is really about not only adapting to climate change, but also addressing the root causes of climate change and look at societal transformations to go to more circular and regenerative ways of working as a society. And floating infrastructure is not so much only about technology, it's about enabling floating communities, also as a testing space for new societal models. So we want to, uh, we want to create a testing space on the water where we can also look at new types of society that are based on different values and so that it can really be a solution. Because if we repeat uh, the mistakes of the cities on the land, if we are going to repeat those mistakes on the water, we're not solving anything. We just increase the size of our problem. So we need to use this opportunity really to have a transformation and really to look at fundamental game changers in terms of uh, urban development. And then the urban development on the land can also learn from our developments at sea. What kind of value, values are we talking about? So on red, uh, you see my uh, opinion of the current uh, dominant uh, values. And so we still consider environment as an infinite uh, resource. We're very much focused on cost efficiency. Uh, still, many policies are based on the myth of eternal economic growth. And uh, we see certainly in Western society, a big focus on individualism, uh, very much competitive. The citizens are regarded as passive consumers. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, they need to go shopping, they need to consume a lot to keep the economy going. We see centralized government control and we see fragmentation of expertise. And I think in the future, floating cities could help in uh, building more knowledge about the intrinsic value of nature and ecological services. Not only focusing on cost efficiency, but also on the positive total ecological system impact. And moving from eternal economic growth to a more supporting economy and a balanced society, not only individualistic, but also more collective. Uh, moving from competition to collaboration. Citizen not only as a passive consumer, but also as a co-producer of water and energy. And to have communities being empowered by being involved in the design of floating structures. And to have a more integrated approach, more interdisciplinary and not so fragmented. It requires uh, the quadruple helix model where public authorities, the industry, academia, and citizens work together to make this a reality. Uh, so uh, we need to connect these different worlds to 
to make it happen, huh? to, to create larger scale floating developments. And it also needs to, to reconsider our role in ecosystems. So on the left is a little bit how we organize it now, where we see the human beings on the top of the food chain. And we need to find a way how we can be part of the ecological system again, how we can play a positive part uh, in, our, uh, yeah, in our food uh, system and our ecological system. I want to stress the importance of collaboration and knowledge sharing. So we should not compete with each other. We need to work together. Uh, and of course, the presentations of the Second World Conference on Floating Solutions, they're all open source available. You can have a look at them. And, uh, and we have worked on the world's largest open source knowledge base on our website. You can visit our presentations and publications and, and learn about it. We've seen Space at Sea, the European project, where you can still find uh, all the publications and deliverables. And I'm also very happy that the Global Center on Adaptation in Rotterdam, they have uh, one of their offices, a floating office, and they have established a community of practice on floating development to facilitate a knowledge exchange and collaboration. And we're quite happy as Blue 21 to be one of the key contributors to this community of practice. And I invite you also to visit this community of practice and also become a member and to, uh, to join this process of uh, collaborative effort so we can learn from each other. Okay, of course, uh, we also, um, as Blue 21, we're also a business. Um, so how do we deal, do this as a business? So, um, and I think, of course, then the investments is very important to achieve the proof of the skill. We need to work together with investors. And our company has uh, received an investment from Buxeros Capital, which is also partly established by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, the Dutch Good Growth Fund. And we have established also a sister company, uh, Finest Floating, in the Baltic Sea area, together with uh, the Angry Birds investors. We're working on uh, strengthening construction capacity. We have a very fruitful collaboration with the Shimizu Corporation, top 20 building contractor in the world uh, to engineer and build floating cities. On the technical challenges, we work together with Marin and other research institutes such as the Delft. And for the societal challenges, we work together with NGOs and government agencies. And we've also established our own Blue Revolution Foundation uh, to uh, work even more on uh, creating more awareness for this solution. A little bit about our collaboration with uh, the finest float in the Baltic uh, Sea, where a big tunnel uh, project is being created uh, between uh, Finland and Estonia. And along this uh, tunnel trajectory, we're working together uh, with the Angry Birds investors uh, to create floating islands. And this could be also a very big example project that would be very unique in the world. And uh, we have uh, established a joint venture together with, uh, with Angry Birds investors. Also already for four years, we have a very fruitful uh, collaboration with the Shimizu Corporation. Uh, and our shared mission is to create sustainable floating uh, cities by building on the water. And here you see our teams our, uh, that work together already a lot. Uh, so Blue 21, we're maritime urbanists and pragmatic visionaries. And uh, Shimizu are very innovative engineers and also uh, highly qualified uh, experimenters. And I think uh, we need to build these kind of collaborations uh, to, to implement uh, these kind of uh, very big uh, and important technologies in the future. And we're also very happy that the third, uh, the third, number three, World Conference on Floating uh, Solutions will be organized next year in Tokyo in uh, 2023, co-organized by Shimizu. And, um, and of course, also uh, the other partners. And uh, the call for abstract is open. So I also invite all researchers and people interested in this also to learn more about this uh, conference that is uh, coming up. The future, of course, begins with a dream. And so we want to have a positive impact on the environment and we want to be comfortable, secure and sustainable. And uh, we're very happy to find uh, yeah, partners with the same kind of mission. Also in terms of uh, research, uh, the collaborative r and I think it's uh, very important to, to work on, on the, th the topics that I already explained about. So uh, it's never just on your own. It's always in, in consortia, in collaborations. We need to move, I think, from adaptation to transformation, to move from slow, slow, uh, small pilots to fast, large scale implementation. Uh, we need to move to uh, inclusive transdisciplinary planning and not reinvent the wheel, but mobilizing real expertise and global knowledge distribution and address stakeholder receptivity by addressing the awareness, association, acquisition, and application of key stakeholders. And here you see one of yeah, many impressions of the collaborations that we have done in the past couple of years. Oh, uh, which brings me to the end of my lecture almost, but I, I also want to share, I've been here now for a week, 
in Hong Kong, what I think is the potential for floating structures uh, in Hong Kong. And here you see an, uh, a depth uh, map of, uh, of Hong Kong and the location's characteristics looks actually quite, uh, quite favorable. So everything that's red on this map is land. And then everything that's yellow is uh, shallow water, so up to five meters. And then uh, medium water is five to eight meters, it's green. And then you have eight to 15 is light blue. And then a the very deep water is uh, yeah, dark blue. And I think that in particular, the, the, the green, but, but even more so the light blue yeah, are, are quite interesting locations for floating. So, uh, I, so I think that that could be very, very interesting. And surely floating development could contribute to tackling land scarcity in Hong Kong with improved uh, potential for social acceptance, climate resilience and ecological impact. And in particular, these hybrid developments combining land reclamation and the shallow water parts with the floating developments uh, are very promising, I think. The construction of floating structures can take place elsewhere to speed up the construction process to tackle public uh, the housing shortage that uh, um, Hong Kong is facing. And in the Netherlands, we have the same problem. Uh, also in the Netherlands, there's a big waiting list for public housing. So I think this could be a solution to a very fast prefabricated mass manufacturing of floating platforms and uh, public housing. But it can also contribute to the blue growth and innovation agenda of the city for carbon neutrality and circularity to achieve net negative carbon development. Which brings me to uh, my final slide, the conclusions. I think there are three lessons that we need to learn. Uh, the first lesson is that we need a big vision and scale up. And so we need to move from the demos, small scale projects to mainstream, larger scale applications. We need to move from the inland uh, to the maritime conditions. And how can we build a significant part of the houses for 3 billion people in 30 years? Eh? Because that's the amount of people that are moving to cities. And, and in order to do that, we need to involve investors, big companies, and also work on policy acceptance. We need to keep on monitoring learning and, and uh, exchange knowledge, measuring the impacts of developments, which is on the water drones and innovative monitoring and research. We need to work on international capacity building and global knowledge distribution. And we need to connect not only technology, but also social economy and ecology. We need to connect research, business, government, and communities. And we establish a new field of expertise, which we have called maritime urbanism, where making cities in maritime conditions become a new field of expertise in the world. This is what I wanted to share with you today. And I think uh, I welcome now uh, the Q&A and questions that uh, you might have. Thank you very much.